Howdy. So today we're, we're the big five. We're going to be talking about quadruple net value of Mandolin Garden. And so first, uh, I'll start telling you all my, about the quadruple net value, if you all don't know what it is so far. Uh, so it's the real estate property, and we're looking at four different values to what increases the property value of it. So the first one is social cultural. So basically this is talking about like events, talking about stuff that's bringing to the area, whatever real estate you have. The second is the economic, talking about all the values, the revenues, the property value, uh, the adjacent property value. Uh, the third is the environmental, talking about what kind of brings environmentally to the area. And then the fourth is the sensory. So this one's kind of like, when you come to a real estate property, you don't really know why you like it, but you just know that you do, and that's from your five senses. Uh, and so these four things are what really help create enduring value to uh, a real estate property. And so here's the big five. I'm Ryan Gott, I'm the leader. And we have Jen, who's in charge of sensory. Chris, who's in involved with the economic. Blake, with environmental. And Sanjana, with the social cultural. And so next we'll talk briefly about Vanlin Garden. It's in Cyprus, which is northwest Houston. Uh, it was once a weed-invested eyesore retention base where there's two of them in the center of a community. And so there's 2,000 people in the community, and uh, <clears throat> so Mary Telly, who's in charge of Tally uh, Landscape Architecture, came in to this eyesore retention basin and created an 11-acre oasis of a redevelopment project. And so the dates that were uh, constructed, October 10th to the 11th.
Alright, so I'm going to start us off with the uh, environmental values of Mandolin Gardens. Um, first we'll talk about green space. Um, so the site is around 11 acres, 7.3 of that being um, used as green space, which is about 66% of the park. Um, over 230 trees have been planted um, since the beginning of the park, and 13, around 1,300 plants in the North Basin, and about 2,700 in the South are combined, um, total 4,000 plants have been planted since the beginning. So these are the, uh, the planting maps, um, which give you basically um, all the types of plants that um, were in the original blueprints at the start of the, the project. All right, so as far as environmental certifications of Mandolin Gardens, um, it is a park, so it can't be LED certified. Um, it's a community park, no buildings, so um, it does not meet any of those requirements. <coughs> it's also not currently SSI certified, <coughs> however, it does um, meet a few of the requirements and has about um, half the points, the total points, which um, it could be eventually SSI like certified, but as of right now, it's not. Um, it does have several awards, such as the um, Park Design Excellence Award, um, the Community Forestry Award, and then um, the Development of Distinction from <coughs> ULA Houston um, in 2012. Um, so yeah, it does have several awards, just not the, uh, the two main um, certifications. So as far as so stormwater management practices, um, the park uses filtration, that's why you see those fountains there, um, it uses a filtration system um, in, the, uh, in the basin. Um, it also uses uh, native plants to manage the stormwater and the runoff water, um, and it helps control the erosion um, whenever it floods. So basically that, oh, so basically that detention basin um, acts as a filter for all the runoff water, it lowers the, that runoff coefficient, and um, also helps to water the, the plants in that wildlife habitat area. Um, some more water management practices, um, they designed a full irrigation system that's a spraying drip system, um, rotors and sprinklers that, are, um, that have a rain sensor, so basically if it's not raining, it's in the drier months, um, that sensor will kick in and it helps water all the plants, it uses all that runoff water. Um, so basically all the reclaimed water can be used to irrigate the total green space of the project um, in those drier months. Um, as far as environmental education, um, uh, it was designed not only as a community trail but as a wetlands and wildlife habitat. With that being said, there's a few signs that just you know designate the wildlife areas, um, so I guess that can be considered environmental education. Um, but other than that, the website actually has information where you can find all of the the um, insects and the inhabitants of that park, all the different wildlife, um, as well as the benefits of their maintenance program. And, how it brings value to the environment. Um, they also send out newsletters to residents that include different um, environmental uh, things about the park. Are we talking about the social and cultural value that the park adds to the community? And the um, first parameter that I'll be talking about is the safety and security. So the Harris County Sheriff's Office is the patrolling unit in that county and um, the highway patrol is the closest to the park so there's no particular station that we can go around. So the most important form of security for this park is the dog walkers and joggers. So they form an uh, informal uh, security measure and the uh, crime rate in the community is very low versus the other areas because of uh, the park and its activities. And, um, there's also no street lights in the park, uh, and it's in and it's intentionally done so as to reduce the activity during night, which would further increase the security of the community. <coughs> um, coming to the public uh, connectivity, so uh, the sub summit bridge lane forms the main point of access to the north and the south of the park, and um, there are three sets of trails that have been designed at different levels so that the experience of the user is different at every uh, level. And um, every trail and every connector is ADA compliant. So there's no discrimination in terms of uh, a user's <coughs> perception to the place. 
Yeah, and uh, so, and these trails are used for jogging, walking, bicycle, uh, bicycling. And, uh, the um, public transport connectivity to this park is lacking, or I could say. Um, it's, it's at a distance of 0.5 miles, so that's a lot to walk to get through the park, so that's one disadvantage uh, to this place. Um, health. So, uh, this, this, park is, uh, this park can be used for many purposes, uh, such as jogging, walking, and these seating areas, and um, the reflection dome area, and the gazebos could be uh, multifunctional, it could be used for the yoga, it could be used for picnics. And um, also the park, because of the, because of the number of trees that have been planted in the park, it's creating a microclimate within that community, which is very beneficial since uh, Texas is a pretty hot region. And some of the uh, uh, signs that have been put up and these quotes uh, creates awareness for uh, uh, the users. Um, and the main, uh, <coughs> the main importance of the park is uh, it's created a hundred percent increase in the public visitation. That is uh, because it was previously a detention pond and no one used to really come there and visit this place. Now it's it's serving two purposes. It's serving as a re uh, detention pond as well as a, a park which serves the community. And significantly, many events take place in this place. And, uh, there was a bikeathon that was or organized for kids for leukemia in 2012. Uh, it's a very impromptu place for uh, uh, wedding photography and uh, prom night photography. As Mary Terry kept uh, saying, that they didn't really expect this to happen uh, uh, during uh, the design stage of that. And uh, a, a, a national night out was carried out and a lot of uh, residents and the public officials and all of them participated in it which made it uh, a great event. And, um, and also the park has been designed and it's, uh, it's been designed such a way that they've given certain locations where certain activities can be uh, performed such as the reflecting dome, you could sit, you could meditate, you can have a chat with your friends and these gazebos are used for picnics, which is placed at the highest spot of the park so that you can get a view around it. And you have some overlooking pavilions, some bridges. Um, yeah. Um, and, yeah. Uh, and all the events that have been organized in the park are for non-profit and they're usually done with the help of the community and multi uh, I'm going to be going over the economic uh, aspects of the park. The uh, taxable values of the property and adjacent properties have changed a lot between uh, the before the development and after the development. Uh, for instance, in 2012, before the construction, the net taxable value was only 54000 And uh, as of 2017, it increased to 201000 We attribute much of that increase to the, uh, the park, uh, rejuvenating the community. Mandolin uh, Garden is adjacent to three different communities. There's the Mandolin Park, Mandolin Village, and Grant's Trace. And during the recession, all three of these communities took a huge hit. But, um, as, as you can see, the, um, uh, um, after, after the recession, after the building of the park, these communities actually began to recover. And you can see in these three neighborhoods, uh, they were all down multiple percentage points between uh, 2010 and 2012 because of the economic recession. But Mandolin Village was actually hit the least out of the three communities. We attribute much of that to it being in very close proximity to the park. If you look at these graphs right here, they show the different um, total taxable values of each of the communities. They show Mandolin Village, Mandolin Park, and Grants Trace. As I was saying earlier, between 2010 and uh, 2012, all three of these communities dropped in total taxable value. But since then, they have gone up significantly, especially over here in uh, the Grants Trace community. Just between 2016 and 2017 alone, they went from 86.05 to 94.74. That is a huge gain, and we attribute a lot of that to the, uh, the positive economic effects of the Mandolin Garden Park. 
park does not technically generate any revenue since it is a non-for-profit park. However, it can generate revenue uh, for surrounding neighborhoods, and this has been seen through uh, local businesses. Their revenues have gone up significant, significantly since the building of the park. Uh, the park cost roughly $3 million to create, and this amount of money actually created a significant amount of jobs, not only in the building of the park, but also in the local community, because it made the community more, a more attractive place to live and work. The Mandolin Garden Park was built by um, the, municipality, the Municipal Utility District 230, and the park was designed to use reclaimed water, uh, which actually reduced the cost of operation, because there was no need to put in um, other sources of water because the park already had it. According to the bookkeeper report for MUD 230 in 2017, which was provided by Mary Talley, the district paid uh, $1,661 for park maintenance in the month of November, and this was just a cost of <coughs> upkeep of the landscaping and not the full cost of the operations. There were approximately 63 real estate transactions annually within a five mile walk of the park, and this is up dramatically since before the park was uh, created. Uh, we believe that a lot of that is because the park actually um, rejuvenated interest in the community. The multiplier effect. The multiplier effect was a little bit difficult to calculate because we didn't have any data on the uh, um, marginal propensity to consume for Houston or for Texas. So for this uh, particular example, I used the marginal propensity to consume for the United States, which is roughly 94%. Since the uh, multiplier effect is a function of the marginal propensity to consume, I used that in a formula, which uh, subtracted that by one, and then multiplied that by the initial amount invested in the park to eventually calculate that out of the uh, three million invested by MUD 230 into the park, it actually was able to reinvest 50 million into the community which provided huge economic gains to the community. Hi, my name is Jin Han, and I'm going to talk about the sensory. Sensory is uh, very important because it, that is directly related to, the, uh, related to the direct interaction between people and place. So it is worth to investigate and talk to you about the focus, what, the, what is the characteristic of the mandatory guard focusing on the <coughs> sensory. First of all, I'm going to talk about the visual part. How many people have visited this area? Maybe all? <laughs> yeah. So when, you, when, you, when, we, when you guys visited the parks, you can feel the positive uh, neighborhood identities through the openings or the user friendly or iconic pavement in the middle of the park and the reflection dome in the southern part and the two fountains and a lot of wildlife. And also, this park gave up open openness through the different park elevation. The park is built not only for the not only for the prevention of the flooding, but also for the function of parks. So, in the function function of parks, people can see them because of the different elevation. People can see more broad area. And also, there are two different. Even though this is one part, you can feel the two, two different environment. First one, the north part is more like a natural environment, so you can see more trees and grasses. On the, on the other hand, in the southern part, you can feel the more like an environment focusing on the people, human. There are more trails and the rock and the island is long to see, and there is a, a lot of quarters in the edge of the southern part. So, even though you can visit the one place, you can feel the different environment. And next is about the smell. Smells came from the plant and the food. There is a lot of trash and <coughs> infrastructure for the uh, negative smell. So people cannot see the that kind of things. And people can see the diverse flowers that uh, our <coughs> mentioned before. There is a lot of flower drawn. So you can you can feel and experience a different season when you visit it. Even though we we may we may or visit it in the October, there is a sunflower, so we can feel the different season through the smell. And next one is about the sound. Usually there is a, a airplane in the northern part, but that is uh, sometimes so. 
usually there is a uh, there is a idea is the peaceful sound of nature, nature from the birds, wildlife, and the fishes or the turtles and the fountains. So we can refresh our feeling through the, the kind of peaceful sound. And next is about the taste. In the about the taste, we can we can eat the food in the in the park mainly uh, three part in the north part and the, in the middle part and the, around the deck area there is a seat and table so we can eat the food over there but that kind of uh, location is also related to the accessibility so that is one kind of characteristic that the planning planner I think they consider and there, even though there is a water I do not recommend the drinking <laughs> there is also water then the last part is about the touch you can feel the touch through, through the different elements of the park. There is the metal <coughs> and the plants and the rocks over there and the water. So we can feel the different touches feeling. And there is also different elevation that I mentioned before. So different can uh, feel the difference about the, our foot touches. And there is a lot of uh, bridges and the benches and pavilions. So you can see that. Uh, we can feel that touches, and that is all. All right, so I'm going to wrap this up. So here are some of the rec recommendations we have for the park. Even though we br think it brings a lot of value to the uh, community, we think there's some things you can add to make it a little bit better. So the first thing is uh, increasing the social events. We felt like the event that they had where we could all go, if you have more events like that, it brings a lot more awareness to the area. The next part is the street lights. We thought that it would be a little bit better if you could be out in the park a little bit earlier, a little bit later. Maybe cut the lights off when it's, so it's not going all night. Uh, other thing, maybe like festival lights for like Christmas time, putting some Christmas lights in the trees. Uh, the next thing is increasing the number of trash bins. We kind of noticed there's a little bit of trash around the uh, entire area. We think it'd benefit if you put more trash bins around the whole area. People that are walking by actually pick up trash and they see a trash bin. Uh, the next thing is maybe have like a food vendor come out at certain times or maybe once a week or once a month and you kind of increase traffic coming in. Um, the next thing is the signage whenever you park. I noticed whenever we drove in, it was kind of confusing where we were supposed to park at, and I was a little bit worried that my car might get towed from parking someone's, like, outside of someone's house. Um, and so, briefly, I just want to go over kind of what we talked about, because I know it's a long, long uh, presentation. So, uh, the environmental parks, it's a chemical-free sub uh, substances in the park. It's a fully functioning ecosystem. Uh, for the social aspects, you create an 11 uh, acre o oasis and it really changes the entire area because the identity used to be a, just an attention base that had brought no value and now it has a new identity to the entire community. Uh, the economic part, it retains and increases property value for all the adjacent properties. Um, it also helps people from outside the community come into the area and provide for the other businesses in the uh, community. And the last part is the sensory. It just brings a place where people want to go to and relax and a pretty popular place in Houston. And that is our presentation. If you have any questions, we'd love to take them. Thank you for your time.